when talking about science and when talking about research methodology, in the end, we need to talk about fraud. We seriously need to talk about fraud. And that's sad. But fraud is human behavior. And you can find fraud and fraudless behavior anywhere in society, in all fields of society, among bankers, among shopkeepers, uh, but also among scientists. And we tend to think that it's not so much in social science, or at least we tend to think it. And then qualitative researchers would tend to think that it wasn't so much in qualitative research, but actually fraud is, can also be found in qualitative research. Why can scientists become frauds? There are three different reasons for it. The first reason is the publication pressure. If you do not publish in science, you perish. You simply disappear from science. If you do not publish enough, you won't get a new contract. So what you have to do is do simple research and publish as much as possible from that simple research. And then the step to fabricating research is not as big as we hope it is. So that's the first reason. The second reason why people uh, start doing fraudulent behavior is because they want to climb or they want to sit on top of the monkey rock. They want to be the gray back gorilla. They want to be the top of the pecking order. So it's about status, getting status and keeping status. And because of the pressure and because the way to get status is by publishing a lot, doing important research, sometimes we see that people grab fraudless methods rather than proper methods. The third reason why people use fraud is because we tend to think that what we think is right. So we tend to think that our theories are best. So if we find something that verifies our results, we simply go for that. So, and we also publish more about stuff that agree with our theories rather than stuff that does not agree with our theories. And related to that is some sort of Mr. Know-it-all attitude. When you are Mr. Know-it-all, you do not actually need this field work. Why do field work when you already know everything? And this is what we saw in the famous fraud case in the Netherlands with Diederik Stapel. This social psychologist who used experiments at one point said, why do I need to do all these experiments? I simply know what theory says and probably it will fit. And in the end, he invented experiments. And the committee doing research on his research um, defined fraud. And they defined it as the fabrication, falsification or unjustified replenishing of data, as well as the whole or partial fabrication of analysis results. It also includes the misleading presentation of crucial points as far as the organization or nature of the experiment are concerned. So it's not just about fabricating the data, it's also about fabricating the process. And another committee that did research into another case of fraud was the committee of Bord, Lejeune and Pels. And they added the deliberate aspect because they, what they said is, well, it's about deliberate fabrication, falsification and unjustified replenishing. It's not accidentally. So they make a distinction between this. And this committee was doing a research into the deeds of Mart Bux. Mart Bux had done field work in the 1980s in the south of the Netherlands into monastery and special rituals which they did in this monastery. But it turned out from the research in the 2000s that he fabricated it. This monastery did not exist. The rituals he was writing about did not exist at all. And people had said that before, but it was all denied. Later, in the 1990s, Mart Bux did research in Medjugorje in Bosnia. And again, he was looking at rituals 
in church, but then the war broke out. And he described a genocide that actually did not took place. So you see these happy people here, but in his imagination, with his growing nose, terrible things he written down. He written about a genocide of people. No one else knew about because he invented it. Later he said, well, I misunderstood my informant. But I think that's a lie. What he also did in defending himself was using good practices of qualitative research. What he said was, I am trying to defend my sources. They said things to me in confidence. So I keep them anonymously. I use pseudonyms. And that's really pretty good. A pretty good standard in science. But he abused it. Second thing he said was, well, in ethnography, we have situated knowledge because we discuss with people while walking, while talking, when looking at rituals and so on and so forth. So we have knowledge that is created in a certain moment. And therefore, it's hard for other researchers to find out exactly about what went on at that time, how this knowledge was created at that moment. Intersubjective knowledge. The third thing he said was, well, we have this literary, literary turn in writing. Since the mid-1980s, we know that we are writing culture. So when writing culture, we do not need to bother about all these methodological stuff. We simply write about the people and we use literary forms. Sometimes we make things a little bit more beautiful than they were in reality. Actually, what I think he did was lousy archiving. He deleted all his archives. He also made things up and then blamed the informants for giving unjust information. And then thirdly, he said, well, because of this beautiful writing, and he wrote beautifully, but he said, well, we have to sacrifice these details for clarity, but these are methodological details, and we need the methodological details. We need the reflective bit. We do not need a realist tale as if it happened, or a confessional tale because it's all about me as a researcher. No, it's both about what did I do in the field as well as what did I see in the field, and how did I create this material. So, we can talk about these deadly sins, and these deadly sins are terrible. And actually, they're also really great because it shows how important research methodology is. And the thing is that if we focus a lot on these fraud cases, we probably forget that every researcher has sins. What Kerman calls everyday sins, minor sins. Sloppiness here, a little sloppiness there not well transcribed interviews, field notes that are not really detailed, conclusions that are drawn a bit quickly, some information left out here, some information added there. We all have these small, regular, everyday sins. And what Kubben says is that probably all these little sins together are way more devastating than these terrible incidents. And what he says is, we are wrestling an angel. When doing science, you're wrestling an angel. So continuously, you have to deal with sins. You have to deal with ethics, not just to the participants, but to science in general. And therefore, we need good methods and great reflection. And what I would like to add is, we need smaller egos. We need self-doubt. We need to sit and ponder continuously and think, why am I right? Why am I wrong? And if you're wrong, we tend to feel bad. But Popper said already in 1946, we should ring the bells of victory every time a theory is refuted. So we should be happy when we're wrong. We should be really happy and dance and celebrate rather than stick to our own stubbornness.